The word of our Lord that we spend a little more time thinking about this morning is that gospel reading that we heard earlier from Luke chapter 9. Do you ever wish that you would get to do something like what Moses got to do in today's first Bible reading? He was privileged to go up to the top of Mount Sinai and to, and to see the Lord in person, to experience some of God's glory. Why that even made Moses' face glow for a while until it would fade away. What if you got to do that? What kind of an impression do you think you could make on your family or your co-workers if that kind of glory would shine forth from you? Well, even Jesus didn't normally appear like that during his visible stay here on earth. Usually his appearance was, was rather ordinary. As the prophet Isaiah wrote, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. And, and some of Jesus' disciples might have been wondering if that was making things more difficult for Jesus. Because at that time, Jesus' popularity had sunk to all-time lows. He met with ridicule and resistance just about everywhere he went. And he seemed to be suffering from a defeatist attitude lately. He had just said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and he must be killed. Jesus was going to die. The disciples were absolutely horrified. Why did that have to happen? Jesus was such a good teacher, such a noble and selfless and serving individual. Why wasn't he getting the respect and recognition that he rightly deserved. Well, then one day, Jesus invited three disciples, Peter and James and John, up onto a mountain. And as he was praying, his appearance changed. His face and his clothing began to shine as bright as a flash of lightning. He was transfigured before them. And the disciples may have thought, well, maybe this is just what Jesus needed. Who would dare to oppose him now? Everyone would want to see him, and they would be amazed. Well, that's not how Jesus chose to have things work out. And for you and for me, it's good that he didn't. We need to realize that that transfiguration didn't change anything about Jesus. <coughs> He always was and always would be true God, eternal and almighty and all-knowing. But since the time of his birth, he normally kept his glory hidden away. But on this day, for just a few moments, he peeled back those layers of humble appearance and his true identity as true God shined forth. Would you like to be able to see Jesus like that? What if Jesus would appear in that kind of glory right in the middle of our church this morning? We'd suddenly find ourselves scurrying for cover under the pews. That's what happened to Peter and James and John. Matthew's account of this event tells us that they fell face down to the ground, terrified. You know why? They felt out of place in the presence of such holiness. They recognized their sin, and they knew that no sinner can survive in the presence of holy God because the wages of sin is death. But that's not what God wants for us. God desires that we would have a face-to-face -face relationship with him. Adam and Eve enjoyed that for a while until sin spoiled it. Even today we can recognize the relationship spoiling power of sin. 
Think of times that we've been uncomfortable to be around people that we have wronged. How much more so do our sins make us unworthy of God's blessings? Because of our sins, we deserve separation from God. And that's why Peter and James and John were down in the dust on that mountain. And we nudged Peter, asking him to move over, to make a little space for us to be face down in the dust. With those disciples, we pray, Lord Jesus, you are holy God. I am a sinner. Help me. Have mercy, my Savior, Jesus. And Jesus invites us to look up. And we see not only a display of power and glory, we see a look of grace inviting us to come to him. And on that mountain, we also see Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus would have been fun to listen in on what they all were talking about. Maybe they talked about some of the great things that God had done in the past. Like the day that Moses got to stretch out his arm across the Red Sea and the waters parted for the people to go through to safety. Or maybe the day that the prophet Elijah prayed and fire dropped from heaven onto God's altar and burned up even the stones while off to the side there were 450 prophets of Baal praying all day and they didn't accomplish anything. Or maybe the day that Elijah was carried up to heaven in a whirlwind when he saw the horses and the chariots of fire. They were actually talking about something even more glorious than that. Luke tells us they were speaking about Jesus' departure which he was about to bring to fulfillment. Jesus was soon to depart from this life. He would go down that mountain and it wouldn't be long until he made his final trip to Jerusalem. But notice how it speaks about Jesus fulfilling his departure, fulfilling his death, and how different that is from what you and I must do. Death is not something that we are able to accomplish. It's something that that happens to us as life is taken from us. But that's not how it was with Jesus. Jesus willingly walked to Jerusalem, even though he knew the hateful crowds were waiting for him. He willingly grabbed hold of that cup of suffering and drank every bitter drop. He willingly opened his hands to the nails of the cross and breathed his last at the exact moment that he determined. And then he pried open the grave and announced victory and every blessed comfort. All of that and more, Jesus accomplished brought to fulfillment with his departure. As Moses and Elijah were speaking with Jesus, we hear about a bright cloud that moved into the top of that mountain and surrounded them all. And then from within that cloud, a voice, this is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. The voice of God the Father. In the middle of all of that, as the scene was about to come to an end, Peter didn't want it to end. And so he spoke up, offering to build three shelters for Jesus and Moses and Elijah so that they could stay right there. But the Bible tells us Peter didn't really know what he was talking about because he was so startled and afraid by what was happening. That scene could not go on like that. Moses and Elijah couldn't stay there. Jesus couldn't just stay there either and be the Savior that we needed. And so soon that display of glory was over. Moses and Elijah went back to heaven. Jesus' appearance returned to what it was before. That bright cloud evaporated. The Father's voice sounded no more. And there stood Peter and James and John. That amazing scene 
burning its impression into their minds so that they never forgot it. The Father's voice still resounding in their ears. But what exactly did it all mean? In the second Bible reading that we looked at today, we heard this word. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That light on the mountain of transfiguration is like God's spotlight, God's flashlight directing us right to Jesus, telling us that Jesus is not just a good teacher who offers suggestions for how we should live. He's true God, the only one who can save us. Without him, we have no light or hope, no life, really. Without him, our lives are only predictable patterns of sin from which we cannot escape as the darkness of death awaits. But the light has shined. <coughs> Jesus Christ, the light of the world, in whom we have light and forgiveness and strength. And even more, in that light of Jesus Christ, you have a new you. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. As Jesus forgives you and embraces you with his grace, he changes you. He doesn't just touch the surface of your life. He gives you a brand new identity, makes you his creation with a brand new heart to live in love and service to him and to others. See that light of transfiguration mountain that shines to you, giving you the glory of God and the Savior Jesus who died for you to have real life. Also recognize the eternal nature of the real life that Jesus gives you. See it in the faces of Moses and Elijah. Moses had died 1,400 years before this. Elijah, over 800 years before this, had been carried up to heaven in that whirlwind. And here they are, very real and alive. In their faces, see the bright and eternal future that awaits you as a child of God. Our faces don't display that now. The hands of time show their effects on our bodies and our faces. The hands of time take away our youth and our vitality, sometimes our memories, a little bit at a time or sometimes very quickly. But in eternity, time will have no power to aid you or drag you down. In eternity, there is no sickness or pain or sadness or death. Only endless praising of your God for what he has done. Endless declaring of his faithful work. Don't miss the glory of that life that awaits you. As you look at the light of Transfiguration Mountain. And in the meantime, don't miss the glory of something else that it's easy for us to take for granted. Remember again what, what God said about Jesus that day? This is my son. Listen to him. Don't miss the glory of Jesus, true God, speaking to you in his word. There is no greater privilege, no greater treasure on this earth than the words of Jesus coming to us through the scriptures. Listen to Jesus as he points out your sins so that he can lift you up with his forgiveness. 
Listen to Jesus as he calls you regularly to his house to strengthen you to love and serve and obey him. Listen to Jesus as he speaks in your baptism when he says, you are my own. I have covered you completely with my righteousness forever. You are God's own child. Listen to Jesus as he speaks in Holy Communion. My body and my blood given for you. Be at peace. Listen to Jesus as he invites you to cast your anxieties into his hands, knowing that he cares for you. Listen to Jesus, assuring you that he is in control in all things. And listen to Jesus as he teaches you words to share with others. Think about what that means. Jesus, who shined forth in glory on that day, now chooses to show forth his glory through you, through your life as a child of God, with your words and your actions. He invites you to come into his presence, to receive the light of his glory in his word, so that he equips you to <coughs> reflect that light of his glory and his truth to those around you. On the hands of some wristwatches is that substance that will glow in the dark if you hold it up by a light first. And when you first do that, the, the hands shine kind of brightly, but it doesn't take too long for that glow to fade away. Just like Moses, when he was up on the top of the mountain and he came down and his face was glowing, that glow began to fade away. So too the glow of our faith can quickly weaken and diminish. That's why Jesus knows that we need to be in the light. In the light of our Savior and his word. This is why Jesus calls you each week to his house to be in the light of his word. This is why Jesus invites you each day to read from his word so that you may be in his light. The light of his glory then shines to you. And you receive that glory. And then you can reflect it to others. By God's grace, making an impression on others. Blessing them as you have been blessed. Receive and reflect the light of Christ. Remember, that's what we're here to do every day. Receive and reflect the light of Christ. Amen. I invite you to stand. And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, amen. We declare together today our faith in the triune God using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, Father, the Almighty, maker of